In Revelation chapter 4 and chapter 5, there's some very interesting introduction into the rest of the book of Revelation. In verse 1 it says, After this I looked, and behold, a door was open in heaven. And the first voice which I heard was as it were a trumpet talking with me. Now it's as if it were a trumpet. It was not a literal trumpet. But this is poetic language comparing what it would look like or sound like to him. Which said, Come up here and I'll show you things which must be hereafter. Remember now, this was a vision. This was not a bodily taken up in the heaven so that they were, the Apostle John was literally there in a body form. This was in vision. I want to show you something right quickly to show that, yes, other people have had visions before, and it was not literally a taking of the body somewhere, but it was as, as if they were there, maybe looking down over a location where the vision was taking place. While they were still maybe home in their bed, they might have been in a chair, or they might have been out in the woods laying on the ground or whatever. But all of a sudden, it's as if that they were taken to another location and they could literally see what was going on. In Ezekiel chapter 11, I'll just mention one verse here, verse 24. Afterward, the Spirit took me up and brought me in a vision by the Spirit of God into Chaldea. So you see, it was in vision that it was as if God took this person up, but it was not his literal body. It was only a vision where God actually transferred the location in his mind, his mental processes, and he saw the area that God wanted him to see, even though it might have been 300 miles away and he was in a different location. But it's as if he were over that place looking down at what God wanted them to see. And I've known people in modern day when they've had visions which were of God could be standing in one location or sitting. Other people see them. They don't even know that person's having a vision. And yet as far as he is concerned, his mind or her mind is maybe in St. Louis, Missouri or Panama City or over in the Middle East. And they're actually looking down and seeing certain things and can describe certain streets and locations they've never seen before in their life, never visited. That's the way a vision is. So it seemed like he was there in person, even though he wasn't. Now let's go back to verse 1, of, or verse 1 of Ezekiel now. Verse 1 of Ezekiel 11. Moreover, the Spirit lifted me up and brought me into the east gate of the Lord's house, which looked eastward. So the Spirit lifted him up. In other words, he was laying there, but it was like God lifted him up and took him to a different location. It was in mind or in vision, like you can have a dream in your bed some night that you're overlooking the Grand Canyon. You're not there, but in your mind, your mental processes, you're, you are, and you can literally see the location. Well, this is what God did. He lifted up this person's mental processes, took him to where he wanted him to view and then he wrote down what he saw at that particular location. Notice back now in Revelation chapter 4. It says the very last sentence, which said, Come up here and I'll show you things which must be hereafter. This means prophecy. This is exactly what it said in Revelation 1, verse 1, when John began to take this vision down. Verse 1 of Revelation 1 said, The revelation, or the revealing, the making known of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. So here was something that was going to shortly come to pass. It was literally a vision that was given to John. Now the phrase, shortly come to pass, is a combination of two words in the Greek language. It's number 1722 and the Strong's Concordance and number 5034. Now when I talk about the Strong's Concordance, James Strong took each word in the Hebrew and the Greek language. 
he assigned a number to each word so that you could look up the word in alphabetical order in the Strong's Concordance, and it'll give you a number that he assigned to it. When you turn to that number in the Greek, as I said, number 1722 and number 5034, then you can read the actual Greek word and the definition of that word. So, it literally means, this phrase, shortly come to pass, a fixed position in time. It also means, when you add the other, number 5034, to it, a brief space of time. So when you put both words together and it creates a phrase, literally it means when this fixed position in time or this brief space in history arrives, the events that are depicted in the book of Revelation will take place fairly rapidly over a period of time. According to the whole history of mankind, it'll be a fairly rapid period of time. Now back to Revelation chapter 4. Verse 2 and 3. And immediately I was in the Spirit. And behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. And he that sat was to look upon like a jasper and a sardine stone. And there was a rainbow round about the throne in sight like unto an emerald. Now the first thing that the Apostle John saw was a throne. It was in heaven. So apparently God opened up his mind and envision transported his mental process so he could literally see the very throne room of God the Father in the heavens. And there was someone sitting there. Now, let's go back to the book of Daniel for a brief moment. Chapter 7, for anyone who wants to turn there. And look at verse 9 through 14. Because Daniel also was given a vision. Verse 9, I beheld till the thrones were cast down. These were all the governments that ruled planet earth from the time of the very first world government to the very last one prophesied in the book of Revelation. Then it says the ancient of days did sit. This is what we know as God the Father. He's sitting upon a throne whose garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head like the pure wool. His throne was like the fiery flame, and his wheels are burning fire. Notice the word wheels for a little later on in the message. Verse 10, a fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. So this is a setting of the very throne room of God the Father in the heavens. And then notice what happened. Thousand thousands ministered unto him, and ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. These are angels. Millions upon millions of angels. But before I'm through, I'll show you there was someone else there too. The judgment was set, and the books were opened showing that this prophetic sequence is the very close of the age. Then verse 11, I beheld then because of the voice and the great words which the horn, that was the beast power that was ruling that Jesus destroys at his coming. I beheld till the beast was slain and his body destroyed and given to the burning flames. As concerning the rest of the beast, these were the governments that preceded this final one, they had their dominion taken away, yet their lives were prolonged for a season and time. In other words, the very final government had all, all of the other preceding governments before it a part of it so that it was a composite of all world governments before it. So that's how they had a part of their lives prolonged until the very close. Then verse 13. I saw in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man came of the clouds of heaven. And he came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. So here is God the Father sitting in his throne room, and Jesus Christ came to him. And there was given him this Son of Man, who also was the Son of God, dominion and glory and a kingdom, 
that all people, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away. And his kingdom that which shall not be destroyed. So notice now what was transpiring him here. It was a government that was going to be established. But first of all, we enter into the throne room that is in the very heavens. And we see there is great activity. There's not only activity on planet earth among human beings and nations. But there is God the Father. Jesus Christ stood before him. And there were thousands times thousands, millions upon millions of other individuals that were before the throne of God. Now let's go back to Revelation chapter 4, verse 4. And round about the throne were four and twenty seats. This is in the very throne room of God in the heavens, not on earth. And upon the seats I saw four and twenty, or in modern terminology, twenty-four elders sitting, clothed in white, and they had on their head crowns of gold. So now we're introduced into the very throne room of God the Father, where Jesus Christ also is residing. Twenty-four elders that surround the throne. Notice chapter 7 of Revelation, verse 11, concerning these twenty-four elders. It doesn't say anything. It only introduces the concept of that before the throne, here is 24 elders that surround God's throne. Verse 11 of Revelation 7. And all the angels stood round about the throne. There's those millions time, or thousands times thousands, which add up to millions. And about the elders, there was 24 of them. And the four beasts. And fell before the throne on their faces and worshipped God. So here are elders that are mentioned again but with no further explanation as to who they are or their duties. Yet, here they are, and we're introduced to them for the first time. Now let's drop down to verse 13 and 14, same chapter 7. And one of the elders answered, saying unto John. John is the one receiving the vision. He is seeing a vision previous to this of 144,000 individuals from all the tribes of Israel. They were sealed in their forehead. And the word seal means to set a hedge about as if you were in secret. It was a divine protective method. So there was going to be protection at the end of the age for 144,000. And John didn't know who these individuals were. And then all of a sudden, and starting in verse 9, here was an innumerable multitude from every nation on earth that also was seen by John. And he didn't know who these people were. So one of the elders, one of the 24 elders sitting around the throne of God, asked him a question. What are these that are arrayed in white robes? Where did they come from? The old King James language says, whence came they? Modern English, well, where do they come from? John said, I don't know, sir. You know. Would you give me the answer? So here's what the elder said. These are they which came out of great tribulation and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. So the elder now is conversing. And he apparently, because he gave an answer... They are knowledgeable of what God's plan for mankind really is. So now we see just a little more information concerning them. They are giving answers as to what God's plan of salvation really is. They can talk. So they must have something to do with maybe counseling around the throne of God. In chapter 11 of Revelation... This is where the two witnesses come on the scene. They die. Then down in verse 16, here's a second woe. This is a tremendous battle that comes upon planet Earth that destroys a lot of humanity, lives, land surface. And then he said in verse 14 that a third woe would come quickly. Then in verse 15, here were angels that were preparing to sound 
Then he heard great voices in heaven declaring that the kingdoms of this world were about to become the kingdoms of our Lord and of our Christ. Then verse 16, And the twenty-four elders which sat before the God on their seats fell upon their faces and worshipped God. And then it tells what they were saying, giving him great glory. So they worship God in some way, and they have a purpose for being there. But now let's go to Revelation chapter 14, verse 1 to 5. Because once again, the 24 elders are mentioned. But I want us to get the entire concept of the time setting in which the 24 elders are mentioned. So we'll read verse 1 to 5. And I looked, this is John talking, and lo, a lamb, notice a capital L, and it's Jesus Christ. He was the lamb of God slain from the foundation of the world. He stood on Mount Zion, and with him 144,000 having his father's name written in their foreheads. So here is Jesus standing with 144,000 individuals that we saw back in Revelation chapter 7 that were sealed for divine protection from the beast power, the mark of the beast, and the number of the name of the beast, and the image of the beast. Verse 2, And I heard a voice from heaven as the voice of many waters, and as the voice of a great thunder, and I heard the voice of harpers harping with their harps. So there's now individuals who are playing harps. And they sung, as it were, a new song before the throne, before the four beasts and the elders. So here they're playing this harp. They're singing this song, and it's a new song, and it's being sung before God the Father, the Lamb, the four beasts that we have not been introduced to fully yet, and the 24 elders. And it says, No man could learn that song but the 144,000 which were redeemed from the earth. By the time this setting comes along, it says clearly, These 144,000 were redeemed, past tense. They won't future be redeemed. They already are redeemed. But they are not a part of the 24 elders. The 24 elders were there before there was anyone redeemed from the earth. And I'll show you that in a few moments. But when you look at the phrase, were redeemed, it means were bought. In other words, they, these 144,000, were purchased by the shed blood of Jesus Christ. They had to hear the gospel, the message. Then, once they heard it, they believed it, and God's Spirit drew them and gave them understanding. They were convicted of their personal sins. Then they were baptized into the name of Jesus for the remission of their sins. They were sinless. They were guiltless. They had no more guilt applied to them. That's why they could be purchased from among men. Nobody can receive salvation until they have submitted themselves to Jesus Christ and He's the one that purchases them back from death because the penalty or the wages for sin is death. Romans 6, 23 says so. No one escapes from dying and being dead forever unless they accept the sacrifice which Jesus Christ gave for all mankind. When they accept that sacrifice, all of their sins can be forgiven. Then and only then can you begin to walk in such a way that you could become a first fruit or one of these 144,000. Let's look at verse 5 now. And in their mouth was found no guile, for they are without fault before the throne of God. This setting concerns the 144,000 of Revelation chapter 7. It says clearly in verse 1 that they stood on Mount Zion. And the Lamb 
capital L, meaning Jesus Christ, was there. I want you to hold your place right here, but I want to show you a scripture that is so powerful and it tells us where these individuals are going to be. Hebrews 12, verse 22 and 23. And you, that's those who are redeemed by the shed blood of Jesus Christ, are come unto Mount Zion. Here it is. And unto the city of the living God. Did we see that in Daniel chapter 7? The heavenly Jerusalem. Not Jerusalem over in the Middle East. Not new Jerusalem coming down from heaven and residing on planet earth when the millennium starts. Or even at the end of the millennium. Whichever it will be. But this says heavenly Jerusalem the city of the living God. And who else are we coming to? An innumerable company of angels. That's who those thousands times thousands or multiple millions and maybe even billions of individuals were that was standing before the God of the universe and His throne and the Lamb was there and the 24 elders and the four beasts. So here is a group of individuals, 144,000, that were redeemed from the earth. And they are right there in the very throne room of God the Father at a certain time in history. Now verse 23, who else have we come to? To the general assembly and church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven, and to God the judge of all and to the spirits of just men made perfect. That you and me are going to be made perfect, and we will be standing right there in the very throne room of God the Father. So the 144,000 appears before God the Father's throne, where the four beasts, the 24 elders reside, the multiple millions of angels. These 144,000, because you see, it says clearly back here in verse 4, which I'm going to read now in Revelation 14. These are they which were not defiled with women. False churches. Paganism wrapped up in a Christian sounding wrapper. They are virgins. Now, anyone who knows the English language knows that a virgin is a female who's never had sexual contact and intercourse with a male. So it is. Once we are redeemed from this world, we have followed Jesus Christ and we have put off as we learn point by point the paganism of this world. Those who succeed completely and thoroughly are the 144,000. These are they which follow the Lamb, capital L, whithersoever He goes. Wherever we prove in this scripture what Jesus Christ expects, we do it. We don't say, yeah, but. You know, I know hundreds and hundreds of Christians that have the yeah, buts. And that's not diarrhea now. That's yabbits. That's diarrhea of the mouth. I will obey God, but I've got to do this first. Oh yeah, I'll get around to keeping the Sabbath as soon as. See? Oh no. When you find out, that's when you do it. When you are convicted that this is truth and I have found it in the living Word of God, that's when you do it. Otherwise, you're not following the Lamb wherever He goes. These were redeemed from among men, being the first fruits. Now, the statement I want to make next is, why in the world would God Almighty and His Son Jesus Christ, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, inspire these are the first fruits, being the first fruits? unto God, unless there were going to be second fruits. 
You would never say first unless it's automatically assumed there'll be second. So someone is going to represent first fruits. And then there will be another harvest of individuals out of the earth. But this 144,000 is standing in the very throne room of God the Father, Jesus Christ. And it says so, and it cannot be denied. It says it right here. It says it in Hebrews chapter 12 also. And there are yet other things yet to be accomplished. And they're already in the throne room. You know, you can have a first resurrection, but you can also have A, B, C, and D. And that's all a part of first. See, then you go to second. How many of us have ever taken tests in school? And maybe you have a test, and here's question one. Then there's subsection A, B, C, and D. But that's all question one. Well, what did Jesus say in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 20 to 23? Each man would be resurrected in his own order. There is an order of resurrections. Could it be the 144,000 will be sealed and they will be the first ones offered into the very throne room with their new bodies? Even right at or before the great multitude ever received their new bodies? What about the two witnesses? Didn't they ascend into the very throne room of God the Father before the seventh trump, and then all those that are in their graves came out of their graves? These are just questions. We don't have every single answer. God does, though. And no matter what we believe, even if it's wrong, it won't prevent Jesus from performing His program. So it doesn't matter, see, whether the 144,000 go into the very throne room of God preceding the two witnesses and maybe the great multitude. If it does, it'll be a wonderful thing. But if they don't, they'll still receive their body at a certain time. We do know this. The 144,000 are still in their flesh and blood bodies in Revelation chapter 9 Verse 4, so they're not going to be in a throne room before the first four trumpets and into the fifth when they open the fifth trumpet when there is a great warfare that destroys one-third of mankind. So sometime after that period and before the seventh trump, these people will be in the throne room of God. Now, remember, there are some people who believe in Jesus Christ. They cast out demons in the name of Jesus. However, Jesus said in Matthew 7, 21 to 23, He never knew them. Why? They were workers of lawlessness, iniquity. So who are these 144,000 going to be? If they follow the Lamb everywhere He goes, isn't this book called the Bible, the Lamb on paper? Didn't Jesus say in John 5, 45 to 47, the last two verses or three verses of the chapter, if you won't believe Moses' writings, you won't believe my words. And don't most of the churches teach that the Old Testament is done away? You can read it for inspiration, but it's not binding upon us today. So if they won't believe Jesus, who inspired, because according to 1 Corinthians 10, 1 to 4, he was the God of the Old Testament. And if they won't believe the writings he inspired Moses to put down on paper, they'll certainly not believe his verbal words in person. And they didn't. And so now the New Testament is the life of Jesus. And the important activities that he carried on, it's the testimony. The Old Testament is the law. The New Testament is a testimony that Jesus is the Son of God. That's all. And in Isaiah chapter 8, verse 20, I believe it is, it says if they want to the uh, law and the testimony, if they won't speak according to that, there's no, no light in them. So these individuals are going to believe all this book and be living by every single word of it. These individuals also, I believe, are prophesied somewhere else in the Bible. I believe you can turn to Malachi chapter 3. And you can find individuals who, who are the very end time group that God may be calling the 144,000. Because look at verse 
16 to 18 of Malachi 3. Then they that feared the Lord spake often one to another. You know, if you fear the Lord, that means you have great respect for Him. You hold Him up very highly in your eyes. Therefore, you will do whatever is expected of you. And the Lord listened. He hearkened the old King James word. And He heard it. You know, every time people who really have the covenant of God and are fellowshipping with one another, and they're talking with one another, there's always angels there listening. There are watchers, according to the book of Daniel, and they're watching every activity of every human being on planet Earth. They're the eyes of the Lord that I'll prove before I'm through that run to and fro through the Earth. They're not His personal eyes, but He's created a way to know everything that we do so that He'll know who fears Him and speaks often about Him. And a book of remembrance was written before Him for them that feared the Lord and that thought upon His name. They shall be mine, says the Lord of hosts, in the, that day when I make up my jewels or my special treasure. I will spare them as a man spares his own son that serves him. Want to be spared from what's about to come upon the, the planet? Luke 21, verse 36, Jesus told the disciples of His day, and it was for us, not them. It's going to happen today in our lifetime. He said, pray always that you will be counted a worthy to escape all these things. God says, I'll spare them, those that speak often about me. Verse 18, then shall you, you that have been spared, and I believe that Revelation 14, the 144,000 will go into the throne room of God with their new glorified bodies. Then will you return and discern where they're going to return from. If they're at God's throne and the government of God's going to be established on planet earth to bring sanity out of insanity, you're going to return to planet earth, aren't you? And discern between the righteous and the wicked. We're going to become kings and priests, according to Revelation. And we're going to be the ones to make the judicial decisions concerning people's lives as to whether they're righteous or unrighteous. According to whether they're living by God's way revealed in the Bible or not. And the wicked between him that serves God and him that serves him not. Now when is the time setting for this particular scripture? Look in verse chapter 4 of Malachi verse 1 through 3. For behold, the day comes that shall burn as an oven. That's the lake of fire. And all the proud, yea, all that do wickedly shall be stubble. They'll be burned up. And the day that comes shall burn them up, says the Lord of hosts, that it shall leave them neither root nor branch. And when you turn to Psalms 37, chapter, verse 20, it says they'll blow away as smoke. What does fire always leave? Ashes? And smoke. And in Psalms 37, 20, it says, Their smoke will blow away in the wind. And right here, notice what it says in verse 3. You shall tread down the wicked, and they shall be ashes under the soles of your feet. This is scientific. Ashes and smoke is all I ever got when I burn wood in a fireplace. When you burn someone in a fire and they don't get out what is left... The gases in their body goes up in the wind and you have a charred flesh left. Smoke and ashes. But verse 2 says, But unto you that fear my name shall the Son of Righteousness, that's Jesus Christ, arise with healing in His wings, and you shall go forth and grow up as calves of the stall. Now notice verse 4. Very dramatic. And it will narrow down people who will be there. Part of the 144,000 spared these things that are coming upon the earth. Remember you the law of Moses, my servant, which I commanded unto him in Horeb for all of Israel with the statutes, that's the holy days, 
and the judgments. Of course, we can't apply the death penalty. But if one of us were to steal from somebody else in this room, you know, we should apply the repayment plus a penalty. Some things, when you repaid, you paid back 20% in addition to what you stole from the individual. This is God's way. When you do something wrong, you're punished for the wrong physically. And if we repent and change our lives, then we'll receive eternal life. Now let's go. Because I believe these in Malachi are going to be the 144,000. I believe that. If I'm wrong later, that's fine. It doesn't matter. It's worth striving for, isn't it? To get our lives right. It's the intent of the mind. That's what counts. Let's turn now back to Revelation. Revelation, but this time, let's go all the way to chapter 19. Chapter 19 of Revelation. Because it does mention the 24 elders once again. Verse 1 to 4. And after these things I heard a great voice of much people in heaven saying, Hallelujah, salvation, glory, and honor, and power unto the Lord, unto the Lord our God. For true and righteous are His judgments. For He's judged the great whore. This is Mystery Babylon the Great found in Revelation chapter 17 verse 5. All of chapter 18, the end time false religious system combined with a beast or the political system that misleads and misrules the world. For he hath judged the great whore which did corrupt the earth with her fornication, false doctrines, and hath avenged the blood of his servants at her hand. And again he said, Hallelujah, and her smoke rose up. And you see the phrase forever and ever? People think that's the lake of fire. It'll go on forever and ever. No, the Greek word means to the consummation of the age, to the conclusion of the age. So at a certain time when everything's burned up, it won't burn anymore. So it'll conclude. Verse 4, And the four and twenty elders and the four beasts fell down and worshiped God that sat on the throne, saying, Amen, Alleluia. So we don't get a great deal of information about the 24 elders, except they're there, and they talked with John. But now, back to Revelation chapter 4. Let's go to verse 5. Out of the throne proceeded lightnings and thunderings and voices, and there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. Now this has been a stumbling block for many people. What are these seven spirits of God? I've had many people to write me and tell me their interpretation of what the seven spirits of God are. Well, first of all, we need to notice. It said here there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne. And it says, which are the seven spirits of God? So the seven lamps equal the seven spirits of God, whatever the seven spirits of God is, that is what the seven lamps are also. Revelation 1 verse 4 gives us a little indication, not much. John to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace be unto you and peace from him which is, that's presently exists, which was, did exist in the past, which is to come, exists in the future. In other words, eternal. And from the seven spirits which are before his throne. So, we know it's before the throne, but it is totally separate from the 24 elders. It's separate from the four beasts. And notice verse 5 here in chapter 1, and from Jesus Christ. So the seven spirits are separate from Jesus Christ. It's something totally different than all of those. And it's before the throne of God. Now let's go to Revelation 3, verse 1. And unto the angel of the church in Sardis write, These things says he that hath the seven spirits of God. Now, if you have a red letter Bible, you'll see this is Jesus talking personally to John. So Jesus is the one who has control of the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. 
Now, when you go back to Revelation 1, verse 20, you see what the seven stars are. The mystery of the seven stars which you saw in my right hand and the seven golden candlesticks. The seven stars are, that means the seven stars equal the angels of the seven churches. So, in the end of the age, there's going to be seven branches of God's true church working in the earth that we're aware of. Not just us. There's going to be six others in addition. And they're described, their various spiritual conditions in chapter 2 and 3. But here it says clearly that Jesus has control of the seven spirits of God. He has them. They're under His control. Whatever He wants to do with them, that's what happens. So we've got to find out, and that's the key, what the seven spirits are, or can we find it? Or are they one of these secret things of the Lord, according to Deuteronomy 29, 29, that we'll know after Christ returns, and He explains to us. In Revelation 5, verse 6, And I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne, and of the four beasts, and in the midst of the elders, stood a lamb, that's Jesus, as it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes. Look at the seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent forth into all the earth. So the seven spirits of God are seven eyes. It says so right here. And they're sent forth into all the earth. So why in the world would God send seven eyes into all the earth? And they represent the seven spirits of God. It's because these eyes are watching and overseeing His purpose being fulfilled on this planet. Why do we say and read all the way back when God, remember He, in, in Genesis chapter 11, He changed the languages? What did He say? Let us go down and see what they're doing on the planet. So they had to come down to personally see with their own eyeballs what was going on. So how else would God know what's going on unless He sent something down to watch and relay the message back? We can begin to understand some of what God's doing by this Hubble telescope that was sent up. Wasn't it supposed to look out into deep space and see things and send it back in picture form so that we on planet Earth could know what's happening out there? So God in some way is sending the seven spirits or the seven eyes of God into all the Earth to see what's going on. They're looking in St. Louis, Missouri today to see who's in church today. They're looking to make sure that people are being honest with God up there in Kentucky and Cincinnati, down in Alabama, out on the West Coast, in Arlington, Texas. They're going to know because, you see, nobody's going to be saved and they're not going to be spared whose hearts are not right with God. The seven spirits, which are the seven eyes of God sent into all the earth to see what's happening, will report to God and He'll know. Let's look and verify this because, you see, the Bible does interpret the Bible in various places. Let's go to 2 Chronicles chapter 16. 2 Chronicles 16. This is the dealings in Old Testament times because you see Jesus Christ in Hebrews 13, 8 is the same yesterday, today, and forever. His tactics haven't changed. Verse 8 and 9. Were not the Ethiopians and the Lubians a huge host 
which were many chariots and horsemen, yet because you did rely on the Lord, he delivered them into your hand. So here is the spokesman at this time of Israel reminding them that God intervened on their behalf. Verse 9, For the eyes of the Lord, or the seven spirits, or the seven eyes of the Lord, run to and fro throughout the whole earth. What's the purpose? To show himself strong in the behalf of them whose heart is perfect toward him. You see, we have heard in the past about serving in our government. They've had commercials on TV saying that the Marines and the Army and the Navy are looking for just a few good men. You see, the eyes of the Lord are going throughout the earth. They're looking for those who have a perfect heart toward God. Those are the ones that He's going to make strong in the eyes of the rest of the world at the close of the age. And at least two of them will be called the two witnesses that are going to stand before the beast power. Whether they will be supported by church members backing them, we'll find out. God does not tell us. It only says these two men that stood before the God of the earth. But here is a very definite reason for the seven spirits and the seven eyes of the Lord. To go throughout the whole earth to find people who have a perfect attitude toward God. And then He's going to strengthen them in the eyes of the rest of the world. And He's going to help them, be with them, guide them, give them divine guidance, give them protection so that they can show forth the greatness of God to the rest of the world. This divine guidance and protection is going to happen to someone some group, some church whose heart is perfect toward Jesus Christ at the very close of the age. I didn't say they were sinless, did I? I said this group, these individuals, heart, their attitude of mind was perfect toward God, not sinless. No man or woman is sinless, only Jesus Christ. The time setting for this is the book of Revelation. And the book of Revelation's time setting, according to chapter 1, verse 10, is the day of the Lord, the very close of the age, right before the return of Jesus Christ. These people are not sinless, but their heart is right toward God. This is the attitude that God is looking for. Psalms 51. So that some can be manifested to the rest of the world. And then they are going to be seen and known by people on planet Earth as God's people. They may be hated because, you see, we will be the ones that they will accuse of disrupting planet Earth. But in God's eyes, these individuals are going to be the ones who are perfect in heart. Psalms chapter 51, verse 7. King David, as we know, at least lusted greatly after Bathsheba. He committed adultery, had an illegitimate child that God allowed to die. Then he committed murder by sending Joab out on the front lines, who was the husband of Bathsheba. It was a deliberate, premeditated thing. And yet here's what he said to God. Purge me with hyssop. I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. He wanted all of these sins blotted out. This was the attitude this man had. Verse 9 and 10. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my transgressions. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Isn't that the attitude that we have to have? Verse 17. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit. A broken and a contrite heart, O oh God, will you not despise. This is what God's looking for. God's spirit or God's eyes or lamps, the seven lamps, seven spirits, the seven eyes, 
saw in the King David's heart, it was perfect before God, even though he committed heinous sins. What about our past? Can't we at least identify one sin in our life that would have brought the death penalty? David was not sinless, but his attitude was perfect toward God. And you can look up the words in the Strong's Concords and find scriptures where it said God was, or David was a man after God's own heart. That's the attitude. Not sinless, but perfect in attitude toward God. Wanting to be sinless. Being sorrowful for the sins we've committed in the past. The eyes of God are watching every one of us. Nobody's exempt. God knows whether you're keeping His commandments. God knows whether you're keeping His laws concerning giving to support the ministry. You see, it doesn't matter to me. I can't save you. I can't put you in the lake of fire. Only God can. It's His eyes that need to know, not mine. That's why it doesn't matter to me. I don't pry into people's private life. I just show you what God expects. And then it's up to you. Because you see, the eyes of the Lord are going to and fro through the earth. Some of them are in Nigeria today. There are people who keep God's ways affiliated with this church in Nigeria. His eyes know what they're doing today. His eyes know what they're doing in New Jersey, Baltimore, Maryland the suburbs of Washington, D.C. and the state of Maryland and Virginia. They know what they're doing in Pennsylvania and Florida. God's eyes run throughout the earth. Because you see in 1 Peter 4, 17, it says judgment must begin at the house of God. And at the last trump, if all those are in their graves that have already been judged and those that are alive are instantly changed to the new spirit body, when are they being judged? Right this very day instant in time. So God's eyes must be able to look into the inner recesses of our mind, our thought processes. Didn't Jesus, when he was standing on planet earth in his human body, read the minds and the thoughts of the scribes and the Pharisees and he knew what they were thinking? Doesn't God have the capability of doing the same thing through his eyes that he sent throughout the earth? Yes, he does. He will not let someone that he does not know be saved and in his kingdom with a new glorified body. He's going to know every one of us, upside down and backwards as the old saying goes. He will know you from the very top molecular cell in the top of your hair to the bottom of your feet. He's going to know everything about every one of us. Verse 6, Revelation 4. Verse 6. And before the throne, remember we're in the throne room of God and discussing who's there. There was a sea of glass like unto crystal. Let's liken for just a moment this desk that I'm sitting behind and the chair I'm sitting in as a throne in heaven. Out extending all the way out is what looked like a sea of glass. Now, when you look up the word glass, it's number 5193 in the Strong's Concordance. It means transparent. You can see through it. Could that be when, why when Jesus Christ comes into the atmosphere of the earth, whatever he travels in will be transparent? And people on earth will be able to look up with their telescopes, and they will see activity taking place inside this spacecraft. Jesus does travel in a spacecraft. I want to prove to you before I'm through what kind of spacecraft he travels in. I want to prove to you that human beings have seen them before. You listen very carefully to the rest of the sermon. Revelation 15, because what's going to take place on the sea of glass? There's some interesting things will transpire. 
The 144,000, as we saw in chapter 14, were before the throne, before the Lamb, right there. Now chapter 15, verse 1 to 4. I saw another sign in heaven. Great and marvelous, seven angels having the seven last plagues, for in them is filled up the wrath of God. So God has not poured out His final seven plagues upon a sinful world yet. That's Revelation chapter 16. Verse 2. And as I saw, I saw as it were a sea of glass. That's what it looked like. It was transparent. You could see through it. But it was solid and you could stand on it. Mingle with fire. And them that had gotten, remember, it looked like a sea of glass. It was not a sea of glass, but it was transparent. And it looked like there was fire, or at least the color of fire, emanating from it. And them that had gotten the victory over the beast, that's the world dictator that's rising, and over his image, image of the beast, Revelation 13, verse 11 to 15, and over his mark, Revelation 13, verse 16 to 17, and over the number of his name, Revelation 13, 18, stand on the sea of glass having the harps of God. So here are other individuals that are living during the time of this beast system when the mark of the beast, the name of the beast, and the beast and the image of the beast are all enforced. The last three and a half years of man's existence before the intervention of God on planet earth. They won the victory. They didn't take it. Some of them might have been martyred. Others might have have to be living out in caves where they can't find them. And maybe finding plants to live off of. Verse 3, And they sang the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb. That's Jesus saying, Great and marvelous are your works, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are your ways, you King of, or King of saints. Who shall, be, who shall not fear you, O Lord, and glorify your name? For you only are holy. For all the nations shall come and worship before you. For your judgments are made manifest. So who is here? Those in the end times that get the victory over, number one, the beast. Number two, the image of the beast. Number three, the mark of the beast, the economic system, the religious system, the political system, and the number of his name. So those four areas. The 144,000 were the first fruits. They were there. Now here is another group at the Sea of Glass. Heavenly Jerusalem or Mount Zion is where they're located. This sea of glass. It's the same place. This is where God's throne is located. Now, I want you to notice though back in Revelation chapter 4 and verse 6 where we were just reading. Chapter 4, verse 6. It says the last thing, or let's see, the, the latter part of the verse, were four beasts full of eyes before and behind. Here is four beasts full of eyes. What in the world is this? We've seen the seven spirits, which were the seven eyes, which went into all the earth and looked and found righteous people. But what in the world are these four beasts full of eyes? Now, the word beast is number 2226 in the Strong's Concordance of the Greek language. It's from number 2198. It means to live or living creatures. And King James, their translators, just called them beast. But they're living creatures. And they're before the throne. This is interesting to me. And they're full of eyes before and behind. So what in the world could this be? What are they for? Why would God even have living creatures full of eyes before and behind? What's their purpose, their function? We only get glimpses. We can't, we can't find everything about them. But I want to show you a few things. Ezekiel chapter 1. Ezekiel chapter 1, one of the major prophets. 
I want to go through as quickly as I can the entire chapter of Ezekiel 1. There's 28 verses, so I'll skip a little, hit a little. Verse 1. Verse 1, as soon as I find it. Now it came to pass in the 30th year, in the fourth month, in the fifth day of the month, as I was among the captives by the river Kibar, that the heavens were opened and I saw visions of God. Now, Ezekiel received visions concerning God. Things pertaining to God. Things pertaining to his intervention in the affairs of man. Things pertaining to Israel. Now, drop down to verse 4. And I looked, and behold, a whirlwind came out of the north, a great cloud, and a fire enfolding itself. Now, that doesn't make too much sense. A fire within a fire. And a brightness was about it. And out of the midst thereof is the color of amber. Out of the midst of the fire. So here is something, and it looks like it's a fire inside of a fire. And it's a pretty color. Verse 5, also out of the midst thereof came the likeness of four living creatures. And this was their appearance. They had the likeness of a man. And every one had four faces. These are living creatures. So there's more things in the heavens surrounding God's throne than we think and we know about. And every one had four wings. So here was four faces on each one, four wings, and their feet were straight feet. In other words, they didn't have joints. Maybe their feet were landing gear. We'll see. And the sole of their feet was like the sole of a calf's foot. In other words, solid. It went straight flat down on the ground. And they sparkle like the color of burnished brass. And they had the hands of a man under their wings on their four sides. And they, had, and they four had their faces and their wings. Their wings were joined one to another. They turned not when they went. In other words, here they were, four of them, and their wings all came back together and it made sort of a, nearly a square. But we're going to see something else very interesting in just a moment. So that no matter what, when they went, they were joined together at the wings, so one of them would be going straight. If they went another direction, they would be going straight because faces would go in each direction. Verse 10, As for the likeness of their faces, they four had the face of a man, the face of a lion on the right side. They four had the face of an ox on the left side. They four also had the face of an eagle. You compare that to the book of Revelation. It fits. Thus were their faces and their wings were stretched upward. Two wings of every one were joined one to another, and two covered their bodies. Now, we can't visualize this whole thing unless we sat down and made a drawing of it. But we're going to see some more very interesting things concerning this. They want everyone straight forward. That means if the faces of one went straight forward, they four went straight forward. The rest followed because they were all connected together. Whether the Spirit was to go, they went, and they turned not when they went. So it didn't go around the circle like a top. It went straight. Straight. Verse 13. As for the likeness of the living creatures, their appearance was like burning coals of fire, and like the appearance of lamps, so they were bright. It went up and down among the living creatures, and the fire was bright, and out of the fire went forth lightning. And the living creatures ran and returned as the appearance of a flash of lightning. In other words, what if they were sitting on the ground and they turned on their jets? Something like lightning flashing out of it and all of a sudden, zoom, they're gone. So they went and then they came back as a flash of lightning. Haven't we heard of airline pilots literally talking about what they term UFOs in the sky and how they would be going along off, say, to one side of the plane and suddenly it made a 90-degree turn and accelerated and was out of sight in an instant? This is what this is describing. Spacecraft. After all, don't we have to have craft to travel in? 
I don't believe anybody just puffed up in the air and zoom and they were at church today. We all drove automobiles. Verse 15. Now as I beheld the living creatures, behold one wheel. Remember I mentioned wheel a while ago in the book of Revelation. Remember it? Behold one wheel upon the earth by the living creatures with his four faces. Landing gear. The appearance of the wheels and their work was like unto the color of a barrel. And they four had one likeness, and their appearance and their work was as it were a wheel in the middle of a wheel. Is that a gyroscope? Something that gives you control? So that you can be going along and all of a sudden turn at 90 degrees and you don't crash? When they went, verse 17, they went upon their four sides, and they turned not when they went. As for their rings, what is a ring? It's a circle, isn't it? Hmm. So here were four living creatures, but they were attached, but they had rings going around that made it circular. They were all so high that they were dreadful. Verse 18, And their rings were full of eyes round about them four. What did it say in Revelation 6? Those beasts, those living creatures were full of eyes before and behind? Could it be that these, this was the navigational method that is used, the beast have? The guidance system or whatever? I don't know. Look at modern day spaceships and Star Trek and so on. And they're lit up and they got lights around them and it helps them to go. But look at verse 19. And when the living creatures went, the wheels went with them. And when the living creatures were lifted up, in that lift off? From the earth, the wheels were lifted up called landing gear. Anyone in aircraft know it? Verse 20. Whithersoever the Spirit was to go, they went. In other words, God gave them directions. The living creatures followed the directions. Thither was their Spirit to go, and the wheels were lifted up over against them. In other words, here was their feet, and it was like wheels, and all of a sudden the wheels would fold up against them, just like any aircraft does. For the spirit of the living creature was in the wheels. In other words, they sent signals to it, just like we do through computer systems from, say, Houston, NASA, and they send it up to maybe the Hubble space craft up there. And all of a sudden, maybe one of its mirrors opens. Why? Because they sent a signal. So here is the same thing. God sends signals to the living creatures, and the wheels let down because he's going to land or... When they lift up, they fold up under them. Verse 21. When those went, these went. So they all went together. And when these stood, those stood. And when the, those were lifted up from the earth, the wheels were lifted up against them. For the spirit of the living creature was in the wheels. In other words, it had a navigational system when, they, when God built into it and when it sent the signal, it knew what to do. It responded to the signal. Very scientific God made the universe. Verse 22. And the likeness of the firmament. Whoa, what's this? Upon the heads of the living creature. So above the living creatures, the top of it, there was a firmament. What in the world is a firmament? If we don't know what a firmament is, you won't get the picture of what's going on here. The word firmament in the Hebrew is number 7549. It means an expanse or a visible arch. Arch. An arch starts here and it makes a circular and it comes down on the other side. If you have four living creatures and the arch goes above their head, isn't that the top of a spacecraft? Oh my. And you have rings around it and you've got now an arc over it. And you got an ark under it, as we'll see. So you've got a spacecraft that they've actually made photographs of. Whew, tough, isn't it? The Bible is scientific and up to date. Oh, my. And they never lose their navigational field. So they never make a mistake. Because this is God. He's perfect. He's without sin, physically and spiritually. 
Verse 23, And under the firmament were their wings stretched, or straight, and the one together the other, toward the other. Every one had two, which covered one this side on this side. Every one had two, which covered on that side their bodies. So it was surrounded with these arches and then these rings. And inside is where they traveled. Verse 24, And when they went, I heard the noise of their wings. In other words, they were jet propelled or something of that nature. Like the noise of great waters. Has anybody ever set out behind the runway of, say, Lambert Field in St. Louis or DFW Airport in St. Louis and heard them when they started revving up their jets to take off? A great noise. As the voice of the Almighty, the voice of speech, as the noise of an host. When they stood, they let down their wings. Have we ever seen any spacecraft come down, you know, and all of a sudden something lets down and it's a runway and you can walk out on it? Well, these are things we're talking about today, but just showing that there are literal spacecraft talked about in the Bible. And it fits the modern description. Well, verse 26. And above the firmament was over their heads was the likeness of a throne. Oh, my. A spacecraft? <laughs> and here's a throne as the likeness of a sapphire stone. And upon the likeness of the throne was the likeness as the appearance of a man above upon it. Who's sitting on this throne? Who said, let us make man in our image? God did. And I saw as the color of amber as the appearance of fire round about within it, from the appearance of, the, of his loins even upward, and from the appearance of his loins even downward, I saw as it were the appearance of fire. This is the glory of God. What did it look like when Jesus in Revelation 1 verse 13 to 16? He was brilliant as the sun which is fire in full force. And it had the brightness round about. As the appearance, verse 28, of the bow that is in the cloud of the day of rain. A rainbow. So was the appearance of the brightness round about. This was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. Incredible, isn't it? This is the book of Revelation. Brethren, I'm telling you, when Jesus Christ is ready for what Christians call the rapture, there's going to be invasion of spacecraft. They're going to take Christians in spacecraft to the very throne of God. This is what they look like. Don't say this is first Dave 3, 4. And this is absolute, undeniable doctrine where there can be no chance of being in error. But what does this look like to you? And what did it look like that they were standing on? I mean, it fits to me. And it's scientific. You know, God's not a blob. He's not just a spook. And we look at God as a bunch of smoke, you know. And he comes under doors and he just kind of goes into cracks and this kind of... God has a body just like us. We're designed just like him. He sits on a chair. It's called a throne. And the entire universe is upheld by his power. And if puny man can make a round cylinder and a little arch over it and under it and it has wheels that sits down and he can fly in space in it, God's already done it, believe me. Anything man comes up with, God's already got it. Probably billions of years ago. So, God's just now getting around to telling us a little about it. Now let's turn to Ezekiel chapter 10. I better hurry along here. I might not get finished with chapter 4 and 5 today. Fifteen minutes to do it all. Whoopee! Here we go. We're going to get in this craft and fly. We're going to take off, propel it. Put in one of those pellets, you know, that'll make it go, now you see us, now you don't. Warp 5 or 6 or 10. <laughs> Revelation chapter 10, verse 1 to 22, the whole chapter describes the same thing. I'm going quick now, right? It describes the same thing. Only he calls them cherubims. Verse 9, and when I look, behold, the four wheels by the cherubim. One wheel by one cherub, another wheel by another cherub. So there's cherubims, and they're a part of this spacecraft. Then down in verse 13, it says, As for the wheels, it was cried unto them in my hearing, O wheel! So it had wheels to land on. And it has the circular cylinder, and it looks just like it. You know what this chapter is all about? 
God came down to planet earth, to the temple. And he went inside the temple when it was standing in Jerusalem. And he took something out of the temple. And then he left. I don't know if he took the Ark of the Covenant with him into the heavens. All I know is in Revelation, when the heavens is open, all of a sudden, the Ark of the Covenant is seen there. Whether it's the literal one or the human one is only a type of the one in heaven, I don't know. All I know is they haven't found the Ark of the Covenant on earth. They're still looking, but they haven't found it yet. There's a lot of rumors about it, a lot of speculation. All I know is when the windows open in heaven, there it is. Whether it's a, the real one and the one on earth is just a type, we'll find out as time goes on. But chapter 10 of Ezekiel describes the identical thing as chapter 1. Read it on your own time. Now let's go back to Revelation chapter 4, verse 7 and 8. And the first beast was like a lion, the second beast like a calf, the third beast had the face of a man, and the fourth beast was like a flying eagle. So you might say that God had different type of craft. This may not be a craft at all here. It just may be beast. But it had eyes just like the ones back there in Ezekiel, chapter 1 and chapter 10. Verse 8, And the four, be four beasts had each of them six wings about him, and they were full of eyes within. And they rest not day and night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. This may or may not be the same beast. It may be a different kind. But I wanted you to be aware that God does have a mode of transportation. And it just fits perfectly with all the UFOs that people have seen. So whether God and all of His millions of angels have this mode of transportation, and when the demons rebel, they too had spacecraft. See? So, whether they are good or bad, we don't know which ones are making contact with people on earth. But they are doing it, and there's been too much documentation to hide our eyes and say that they haven't been. They have. Verse 9 and 10, chapter 4. And when those beasts give glory and honor and thanks to him that sat on the throne who lives forever and ever, the twenty and four elders fall down before him that sat on the throne and worship him that lives forever and ever and cast their thrones before the throne saying you are worthy O Lord to receive glory and honor and power for you have created all things and for your pleasure they are and were created so the praises of the 24 elders and the acknowledgement is because God created everything and he did it for his own purpose so he has the right to choose whom he will to be in the first resurrection, the next resurrection, each man in his own order, and it's for his own purpose. But he seeks people out first who will have a perfect heart toward him. Now, in Revelation chapter 5, we'll zoom. Verse 1 through 4. And I saw in the right hand of him that sat on the throne, this is God the Father, a book written within and on the back side, sealed with seven seals. Now, why could it be written on the front and the back side? Within and on the back side. Because in ancient times, they used scrolls. You would write, and when you wrapped it around a stick, then it would be <laughs> written on all around it. And so, they, if you had a message to one person, when that message was over, you would put your signet on it. Your ring would be stamped in it, in sort of a wax, and it would seal that part. And nobody could read that but that person that it was designed for. Then they would wrap the next message around and seal it again with the signet of that king. And so here there were seven different sections that were sealed. And you had to open the seal, but only the person that it was given to and it was designed to open it was able to open it. Verse 2. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the book, to loose the seals thereof? They didn't know who was supposed to open this, uh, these sealed scrolls. No man in heaven nor in earth, neither under the earth, was able to open the book, neither to look thereon. And I wept much because no man was found. This is John talking. No man was worthy to open and read the book, neither even to look upon it. So he was 
terribly discouraged. Because you see, within this book was the seven seals. It was a parchment in a roll. And each stamp or signet had to be opened before you could see what it was. And they couldn't find anybody that was worthy to open it. Verse 5. And one of the elders, here's one of the 24 elders, said unto me, Weep not, behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. So it had to be somebody that was perfect with no sin in order to open it. And the only one they could find was Jesus Christ. And one of the 24 elders identified Jesus as the only one that was worthy to open the seals. Verse 6 to 8. And I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne, and of the four beasts, and in the midst of the elders, stood a lamb. Here it is, Jesus Christ. As it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent forth unto all the earth, which we've already discussed. Verse 7. And he came and took the book out of the right hand of him that sat upon the throne. So he took it out of God the Father's hand. And when he had taken the book, the four beasts and the twenty-four elders fell down before the Lamb, having every one of them harps and golden vials full of odors. Notice now, here's vials. If you've seen, you know, uh, Frankenstein, they always have these uh, vials and they're always mixing things in these vials. Well, here's vials full of odors. And it says, which are the prayers of the saints. Did you know God has a vial and one of these 24 elders of the four beasts has it and every one of your prayers are stuffed in that vial? He can open it anytime He wants and hear all of your prayers that you've ever asked. You've got the inside track with God. If you're faithful to Him, verse 9 and 10. I want to read from the New International Version after I read the King James Version on these two verses. Because we're counting down, six and counting. And they sung a new song saying, You're worthy to take the book. So this is Jesus. And to open the seals thereof. For you were slain and has redeemed us to God by the blood, by your blood out of every kindred, tongue and people and nation. The King James Version makes it sound like we are already in the throne room of God at this time. And we are not, because the book, this is a preface to even the opening of the seals and the trumpets. And has made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. So I want to read this out of the James Moffat translation, verse 9 and 10. You deserve to take the scroll and open its seals, for you were slain, and by shedding your blood has ransomed for God men from every tribe and tongue and people and nation. You've made them kings and priests for our God, and they shall reign on the earth. In other words, he's saying, you are the one who selected men all during the ages to be kings and priests. They aren't already there. They are selected to be when the time comes. Now I'll read the same verse out of the New International Version, verse 9 and 10. You are worthy to take the scroll to open its seals because you were slain and with your blood you purchased men for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. See, Jesus is in the process from righteous Abel all the way down to the last person that will be purchased by the shed blood until the last trump sounds. The seventh trump. So they're being purchased today and that's what he's saying. You, Jesus, have made them to be a kingdom of priests and, and serve our God and they shall reign on the earth. So we're to be kings and priests and reign on the earth and he's purchasing us, purchasing us by his blood now. Now the closing few verses and we'll make it. Verse 11 through 14. And I beheld, and I heard the voice of many angels round about the throne. That's the thousand times thousands, millions that we saw. And the beasts and the elders. So really, if you want to get technical, you you could say this is God's throne. It's paradise in the heavens, wherever God lives. And this also has all the spacecraft stations there. All the spacecraft are stored there until they decide to use them. The elders are there. 
the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands. Wasn't that what it said in Daniel chapter 7, verse 9 to 14? Saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power, riches, wisdom, strength, and honor, and glory, and blessing. In other words, Jesus is the one that has qualified. He's the only one, and He's the one that's going to set up the kingdom of God and rule planet Earth after man has run his course of proving that mankind cannot rule himself. And with Satan and his demons loose to deceive, man is incapable of bringing a lasting peace. Man cannot change his own nature. Only God can by the Holy Spirit of God. Verse 13, And every creature which is in the heaven and on the earth and under the earth and such as that are in the sea, and all that are in them, heard I saying, Blessing and honoring and glory and power be unto him that sits upon the throne, that's God the Father, and unto the Lamb, that's Jesus Christ, forever and ever. And the four beasts said, Amen. And the four and twenty elders fell down and worshipped him that lives forever and ever. So brethren, I hope today if nothing else, I woke somebody up to let you know right in the pages of the Bible there are spacecraft. And it's Jesus Christ that's going to open the seals. And when He's ready, He will be the one that sends His angels to gather the elect. How are the angels going to gather the elect? Can all the elect sit on the fingers of angels? Or is it going to be an armada of spacecraft to come take us? We'll see. I don't know every answer. But I guarantee you when you read Ezekiel 1 and Ezekiel 10 and chapter 4 and 5 of Revelation and you put them all together, you're going to get some ideas about how God operates. And they're scientific and up to date. And I say praise God for that knowledge.